excited to be in church today? Yeah, I'm happy. I'm excited too. Sometimes I think about the questions pastors don't ask. Who got dragged into church today? Me, pastor. God bless you. Hey, whether you came excited and willingly or maybe you came dragged and pulled by the ear, you're already here. You might as well enjoy it, right? Give somebody an elbow, say it's going to be good. It's going to be good. If you're new here at Vertical, my name is Verge. I'm the pastor at Vertical Church. I'm so excited and so thankful um, uh, to be able to bring God's word. We have been in a series. This is the closing of our Grow and Flourish series. Hasn't this been a great series? If you've been here the last couple of weeks, man, it's been really good. Um, <clears throat> oh, I forgot to ask. Any, any Christians got their Bibles? Anybody? Any, anybody love God's word? Come on, there it is. Show me, show me. There it is, there it is, there it is. You could put a marker in John 4 and also in Matthew 9. Uh, that's where we're going to be um, today at the beginning. <clears throat> Why grow and flourish? Because we've been talking about um, principles that help you to grow spiritually and to flourish spiritually. Uh, the first message, we talked about church, a place to flourish. Uh, and we really, we really did talk about the reality that uh, as a Christian, it's, it's more likely to grow and flourish when you're well planted in a local church. Uh, that's why Psalm 92 says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree, and it says, planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish. And, um, and I think this is really, really important. We also talked about, um, as, as a church, we are pointing at God's vision, so we're not trying to get 20 different things accomplished as Vertical Church. We're aiming at four major things that we see in God's word from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We see the same four things God wants to see in people's lives. Number one, if we, you'll see them on the screens. Number one, uh, we want to help people to know God. Number two, we want to help people find freedom. Number three, discover purpose. And number four, make a difference. So th this, is, this is the objective and the mission that we have as a church. And so we understood that we needed to be clear on what are the systems that will produce this vision? What are the systems that we need to put in place, the strategy? So this series has really been me as pastor uh, and our team kind of opening the door to let everybody understand this is why we do church this way. So we talked about the system for knowing God. What's our system to help people know God here at Vertical Church? It's our Sunday services. Why? Because we concluded on that message, right, that the local church is the gateway to heaven. People can come to know Jesus at home, at another place, in many places, but 95% of people, what we, and we did the test here in the auditorium, every service, they come to Jesus because somebody invited them to church or to a group. That's, that's just the reality. Um, this, the system for helping people find freedom that we have at Vertical Church is... Our groups, our life groups, right? The, the, it's, it's, it's getting people connected in relationships with each other to work the soil of the hearts. Remember that message? Uh, we had uh, uh, salvation, the seed of the gospel, and then we had freedom, the soil of the heart. Um, and then for helping people discover purpose. What's the system we have at Vertical Church? The growth track. Our growth track is where we help people discover their purpose. We help people identify spiritual gifts uh, passions, personality, and kind of connect the dots and realize God wired you a certain way. And by the way, uh, your purpose is connected to living a fruitful life. We talked about that last week. It is God's will that we, that we give fruit, that we, that we are fruitful and that we are productive in our lives. Um, and of course, the last one, how do we help people make a difference here at Vertical Church? Our impact team, okay? Our impact team. Uh, our impact team is everybody who serves on any and every team that are on Sundays and between Sundays. Uh, and, and the message today is entitled, Impact the Harvest of Serving Together. Impact the Harvest of Serving Together. Can we pray to kick things off? Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today, worship you, open up your word, and learn more about your heart for our lives I pray, Lord, that the seeds of your word would, would land in good soil in every one of our hearts, that we would be receptive and attentive to your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, amen. As we've learned in this Grow and Flourish series, Jesus used many agricultural illustrations when he would teach people. Why? Because he was relevant. Jesus didn't want to be so deep that his message went over everybody's head. He wanted to be 
cookies on the bottom shelf. Everybody can understand it and get it. That's why he used illustrations and examples that were easy for them to understand. He used a lot of agriculture, planting and reaping and, and fruitful uh, and, um, and watering. Uh, all, all of these, uh, the harvest, all of these uh, illustrations, they help us understand. Now, there's this one moment in John 4. Let's go to John 4. John 4, there's an encounter that Jesus has. Uh, it's a famous encounter with a Samaritan woman. Have you guys ever heard that? The Samaritan woman at the, at the, at the well, and there's this encounter, and, and, uh, and it was surprising because, first of all, Jesus was a man. She was a woman. It was kind of weird that he was talking to her. And second of all, he was Jewish. She was Samaritan. They didn't really get along. But, but Jesus has an encounter with the Samaritan woman that changed her life. So much so that in the process of the conversation, uh, she really became aware, this guy's different. <laughs> and at one point, it says that she left back into town and went telling everybody, come and see this guy who has told me everything about my life, and he doesn't even know who I am. I've never met him in my life. And, uh, and, and, then, and then the disciples weren't with Jesus. They were in town. They came back, and they kind of see her with this woman. They're like, what's going on here? John 4, 27, it says, just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, you got to eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone, the disciples asked each other. Then Jesus explained, my nourishment, another version says, my food comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up. And look around, the fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What is the fruit they harvest? People brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plant, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. Can I just highlight a main point here? The harvest represents people who do not yet believe in Jesus. What does the harvest represent? People who do not yet believe. Now, here's the interesting thing is, Jesus is telling them, hey, normally it's you plant, wait four months and harvest. But listen, I just spoke to this woman. I spoke to one. I planted a seed. She just went to whole talk to the whole village. The whole village is coming. And you guys are going to get to harvest. You don't have to wait four months. You're going to get to harvest the, the seed that I planted. And sometimes you and I will have that privilege and that opportunity to be able to harvest some seeds that other people planted and worked. Now, what does the harvest represent? It represents people who do not yet believe in Jesus. Of course, they don't even know him. Matthew 9, there's another occasion where Jesus is doing his thing, verse 35, I want you to check this out, this is important. Matthew 9, 35, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area. What did he do? Teaching in the synagogues, what else? Announcing the good news of the gospel about the kingdom. And what else did he do? And he healed every kind of disease and illness. 36, when he saw the crowds, check it out, he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. Here's a point I want you to highlight or write down. There is a lot of harvest, but there are few workers. Now, this is in Jesus' time. Question, is it much different now? No. Who does the harvest represent? People who do not yet believe in Jesus. I have a question for you. In your work, are there people who do not yet believe in Jesus? 
In your school, are there people who do not yet believe in Jesus? In your neighborhood, are there people who do not yet believe in Jesus? In your family, are there people who do not yet believe in Jesus? And this is why the harvest is so much. There are so many people, we talked about it the first week, that are spiritually lost. There are so many people hurting. There are so many people who are broken. There are so many people who don't know God and much less know their God-given purpose. So many people who need Jesus. Here's the next point. Even today, we don't have a harvest problem. We have a harvester's problem. We don't have to solve the issue of, where's the harvest? There's no harvest. No, no, that's not an issue. There's a lot of harvest. The problem? There's few workers. There's few workers. Listen, Broward County, according to Barna studies, Broward County, it may have gone up point something, but we know this from the last couple of years, is 3% considered church evangelical Christians. 3% of Broward County. Can you, can, you, can you fathom that for a second? 97% of Broward County, according to very simple questions about Jesus, the Bible, and the Christian faith, 97% are unchurched. They don't have a relationship with Jesus. They don't, know, they don't believe in him. They don't know him. So, so, so I ask you again, do you see where the problem is? The harvest is plentiful. The problem, the problem is there's so few workers. And, I, and I, we've studied this at our church last year in a, in a series that we talked about called True Disciples, right? Every Sunday, there's a number of how many people came to church, right? Like we have, this is service three of five. But even if we just talk about this service, this is how many people came. Now, out of this many people, this is how, this is how many people are actually believers in Jesus. Because not everybody here is a believer in Jesus. And then out of these people, this is how many are actually followers, disciples of Jesus. One thing to believe and it's one thing to follow, right? And then out of these, these are the ones that are actually working, for, serving actively, activating their spiritual gifts. So do, do you see where we need to close this gap? Are, are you hearing me? Why? Because the harvest is plentiful and the workers are few. It doesn't say the believers are few. There's a lot of believers. The followers, the servers, the workers. So, so, so where do we start, Pastor? What does the Lord expect from us and want from us? How can we do this? How can we make a difference? That's how we say it here at a Vertical Church. Church, we are called to make a difference. So what do we do? Our system, okay, if you're taking notes, our system at Vertical Church to help people make a difference is the impact team. Why? Because we want to make an impact. We want to make a difference. So what do we do? Here it is. We create an easy process for people to discover their purpose, that's the growth track, and then serve on a team, which is the impact team. Somebody asked me why. Why? Why do we do it? Because it's the biblical model. We see it throughout the word, Ephesians 4. Leadership, Christian leadership should equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Two, because people need to be needed. We know this. People have two major needs, to be known. That's why we do groups. To be needed, that's why we have a team, to be a part of something. Three, because it meets the greatest need of the human heart, which is not self-realization, but rather fulfillment, which comes with transcendence. When, what I, when I am part of something bigger than myself, making a difference in the lives of other people, not to mention the eternity of other people. And four, because God's purpose for our church is in the people that he's brought here. In other words, what does God want us to do as a church? It's connected to who he brought to be a part of this church. So if God brought you to this church and you have come to the, <clears throat> to the conviction and decision to say, I want this to be my spiritual family, you're not here by accident. You are a part of what the Bible calls the body. Christ is the head, we are the body. The question is, what part of the body are you? That's why you have to discover your purpose. And then once you discover it, be fruitful by being a part of what God is doing and serving. How do we do it at Vertical Church? How do we do it? We already said it. We do it through the impact team. Now, how does somebody who's new or who's, who's kind of wanting to connect, how does somebody become a part of the impact team? <clears throat> well, you got to do the growth track, right? Anybody remember? Let's see. I want to see my students today. We're in class, okay? Anybody remember how many steps are in the growth track? Four steps are in the growth track, all right? Does anybody remember, when is step one of the growth track? The first Sunday of the month. Hey, guess what? Today is the first Sunday of the month. We actually have a double play today. So today, you can knock out step one and step two at 2.30. Why? Because next Sunday is Mother's Day, so there will be no growth track because a lot of people have plans with mama, right? So... <clears throat> 
somebody completes the vertical growth track. Now, when you complete the vertical growth track, which is just the four steps of understanding the heart of our church on those four Sundays, then you fill out an application. I, I'd love to serve based on my giftings, based on my experience, based on my passions, based on my abilities. And then we have something called the honor code. Everybody say the honor code. Because, because we have an honor code of, of, of an expectation of, hey, we want to live to a standard, okay? This doesn't mean we expect perfection from everybody. It just means that we have a standard. So if somebody is living in consistent or pers persevering and living in something that's sinful or doing something that goes against God's word, we love on them, but we also tell them, hey, listen, we have a code. We have a standard. God's word is our standard, and we have a code. Does that make sense? So, for example, if somebody joins our impact team, and maybe, they, maybe, maybe they're new believers, and they're not, they, they don't know certain things, and maybe they decide, hey, we're not married yet, but we're going to begin to live together because, you know, we're already having sex and all that. We understand that any sex out of the context of marriage is sexual immorality. No matter what the world says and no matter how antiquated you might think it is because you haven't heard that and you've never studied God's word. So we're going to say, hey, we love you. We love that you're a part of this spiritual family, but we have an honor code and it's important that we're abiding by this standard as we serve God. And if you're not able to do so, hey, maybe we need to pause and talk about this. We want to disciple you. We want to shepherd you in this journey if you want to follow Jesus. Are you following me? Some people sometimes get offended, like, oh, why is the church telling me how to live? We're not telling you how to live your life. We're just saying if you're going to serve or lead in any way, we have a code and we have an expectation. Are you following me? And so there's something beautiful about that. Now, now obviously, once you do the growth track, you, you, know, you agree to the honor code, then you say, man, I'm going to serve on a certain team. You have a, me a meeting with the leaders of that team. You kind of get oriented to what, it, what does it take to serve on this team, if it's a Sunday team, or this team that's maybe a, in, between the week, in between the week team. Um, and then, obviously, we also have our impact team core values. Let me share those with you. Four impact team core values. If you're on the impact team, you know it's love God, love people, serve with excellence, and serve with... Joy, what, what does love God mean? It means that if I'm on the impact team, there's an expectation that I'm going to develop my relationship with God. Does that make sense? So if you're on the impact team, our expectation is you're going to make your relationship with God a priority, priority in your life, and it's going to matter, which means you are responsible. It's not my responsibility, your relationship with God. And my relationship with God is not your responsibility. It's personal. So we want, we want everybody on the team to say, hey, this is a core value. I'm good with God, my relationship with God. Secondly, we want, people, we want our team to love people. Everybody say love people. I tell my leaders all the time, please lead your teams and remind them to love people. To love everybody who walks through those doors, love on them. And I tell my leaders as well, love people even when they're unlovable. How many of you guys know that sheep bite? And sometimes they stink a little bit too, right? Hey, we're all sheep. We're all sheep, right? And uh, sometimes ushers, sometimes ushers are here in the auditorium doing what ushers do. What do ushers do? They ush, right? So as they're ushing uh, into your seat, right? Uh, sometimes ushers will be, hey, this is where you're, no, 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 I want to sit over here. Oh, no, but that's close. And sometimes people are not following because they want to do their own thing. And so, so love on them. They're just sheep. <laughs> sometimes they're frustrating and you want to lay hands on them. But no, no, just love on them, right? Parking team outside is guiding the parking in a, in a specific order, but there's always two or three people who are like, I want to do my own thing. So parking team, love on them and have patience with them. And, 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 and stubborn sheep, don't make us lay hands on you. Right? There's a place, you know, our vertical kids team prepares to care for your kids. That's where the kids should be. Go take them there. Encourage them to be there. Your kids don't tell you where they go. You tell them where they go. Follow the order so that they understand that they don't make the decisions. You make the decisions. Okay? So love God, love people. Serve with excellence. Everybody say excellence. Like if, if your job is to put the, the row of chairs, put them in order, put them straight. Don't put them sideways. Don't put them crooked. That's not excellent. Don't put three straight and one off. Excellence is in the details. Excellence provides comfort. That's why we want to be excellent because we want people to feel comfortable when they come to church. Are you following me? Like if you're going to do it, like do it right. Put it in order. Put it straight. Are you following me? Like, like this is just, okay, confessions of a pastor, per personal pet peeve. Like when I walk in the bathroom, especially like the sink area, I always leave it better than how I found it. I don't know about you. I, I do this. Yeah. Whoever clapped is because they believe what I believe. But some of you are like. Because sometimes I don't know, I don't know if it's a spiritually possessed person who walks in, at least in the men's bathroom. I don't know if it's, a, if it's a young person with like a mane and shampoo in. I don't know what they do. Tasmanian devil. And like, it is like, a, like it feels like that dog Beethoven from the movie just went in there. I, I promise you, I've gone in there. So I'm like, what happened in here? A hurricane? And then I realized some people don't have a spirit of excellence or they just don't care because they don't, they don't feel like, oh, this is my house. Are you following me? 
And so, and, but, then I, but then sometimes I go in and I see people who are cleaning up. Hey, Pastor, how you doing? And, they're, and, they're, and I'm like, oh, spirit of excellence. I like it. Are you following me? So if you're, if you're on worship team, don't try to learn the song an hour before church. You've got to be ready for rehearsal the week before. Are you following me? Like if you're going to serve, if you're going to teach the kids, don't make something up in the moment. Be prepared. Be prayed up so you're pouring in your heart out with excellence because you are prepared. We serve with excellence. Are you following me? And then serve with joy. Everybody say joy. That has to do with your attitude because you, you can do the right thing but do it with a bad attitude. That's like drawing a great drawing and then erasing it. <laughs> you know? And some of you, I'm, okay, I'm not, I'm not speaking to anybody specifically, but some of you, you need to tell your heart to tell your face that you love Jesus. Right. Hey, I'm just speaking for some of you. trying to help you. I'm trying to help, help me help you. Okay? And some of you, tell your heart to tell your face that you love Jesus and that you're saved. Okay? And so we have to be strategic as a church and know where's the best place for some people. Like if you have a lemon sourpuss face, we can't put you in the front door. We cannot have you as a greeter. We need to find another place for you. We need to have you making some lemonade back behind the scenes. Are you following me? There's a place for you, but that's not, that's not the place. Are you following me? But either way, sometimes we have to say, even if, I'm not, even if you're not the most jovial, even if you're not naturally the most you know, joyful and smiley, you have to say, hey, for the good of the Lord, I'm going to serve and I'm going to do with joy. Are you following me? So these are, these are our core values as a team. God always intended for you to live a life of fulfillment. Always. But so many people are settling for less than that. Why? Because they're not living a life of fulfillment. Because a lot of times we're falling short and we're just living for ourselves. Your life is not worth living for yourself. You have to live it for others. You have to make a difference. Uh, John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. He wants you to have a full, abundant life. Now, here's the issue. Here's the issue. Here's the issue. The harvest is plentiful. The problem, the workers are few. And sometimes there's a lot of butts and chairs in church but the percentage of them that are actually activated and actively serving as the body of Christ is few. I would like to believe and say that our church maybe breaks some of those patterns and we're a little bit above average, but even still, can you imagine if everybody said, I am gonna own a piece of this. I am gonna do my part. Whether it's one Sunday a month, whether it's leading a group, whether it's being on the events team, whether it's joining in efforts with prayer team, whether it's serving our kids, whether it's helping, you know, get cars in order and provide a safe environment, whether it's pouring into the young people of VSN. Are you following me? Like there's, so, so the problem is, what, what are the, why is it that we all say amen? Oh yeah, harvest is plentiful. Amen. And the workers are for you. Amen. And we're amening, but sometimes we're not working. Three, three problems that, that are holding many of us back, and you might identify with one of these. Number one, often we let our past limit us or cripple us. You want to know one of the strategies of the enemy? To be like a parrot on your shoulder saying, oh, what, you? You're going to start serving? You are going to start serving? You, Mr. Mess, mess of a life? You, Mrs., you got more problems than who knows what. You're going to serve? And the enemy will come and he will just lie. You with that past, you with that issue in your marriage, you with that, with those words that you were saying last week, you with that kind of lifestyle, and, and all these things that the enemy comes to try to say, you're not worth it. You, you're kidding yourself. You're never going to be. And, and, that's what they, and so what happens is a lot of us say, yeah, I'm not worthy. I can't do this. I'm never going to change. It's never going to work. I can't do anything. What can I do? Look, how, the church is already awesome without me. And that's just the lie of the enemy because if God brought you here, it's for a reason. It's for a purpose. And the enemy loves people getting out of their purpose and not serving and not living for beyond themselves. Two, sometimes we let culture define us. This is a big problem. And so instead of following, following God's plan and will for our life, we follow culture's plan and will for our life. And instead of understanding that we have to live our life for others, we follow the pattern of the world and we begin to live for ourselves. What's better for me? What's more convenient for me and for my family? And, 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 we, and we don't think, is there something beyond that God has a purpose for, for us? Is there something beyond that God has a purpose? And yes, it's good to have success in your life personally. That's wonderful, but never at the expense of being part of something bigger than yourself to make a difference in the lives of people. 
Paul says in Galatians 1, he says, for I do not, for do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men or to please God? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant to Christ. And so I think some of us have a hard time because we struggle with that struggle of the world and God. And that's why some of us aren't serving. Thirdly, another reason is because we try to do it all alone. Why do we try to do it all alone? Because here's what, here's what I believe some people, if you were honest, you would say, Pastor Verge, I tried to get in a group once. It didn't work for me. Pastor Verge, I served once, but, you know, I had some issues and <clears throat> never again. And, and I told you guys, anybody ever had a bad haircut before? Bad haircut? Now, did you say, I'm never getting a haircut again? No. You just said, I'm going to find a new barber. I'm going to find another stylist, right? But some people say, oh, I tried groups. Never again. Just try another group. You might be missing out on a blessing. Oh, I served. Never again. So what happens is you build up this wall of defense because you got hurt or because, quite honestly, you didn't know how to resolve a conflict. And so you ran because of spiritual immaturity. And so what happens is these walls are up. The problem with walls is they keep out the bad people, but they also keep out the good people. So we try to do it all alone. God didn't call us to be lone rangers. He called us to be his flock, his body, his family. And so I'll close off with this. Three important steps. Three important steps if you really want to make a difference. Number one, it begins with a calling. It begins with a what? Calling. God doesn't just want to save you. He wants you to know that you have a calling. Where does it say that, Pastor? 2 Timothy 1.9. Speaking about God who has saved us and called us. Saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus. So here's a, here's a way to say it. I want to make a difference because I have a calling. Point two, it has to stand on a cause. It starts with a calling, but it stands on a cause. And it's okay to do great things, but, but, but you can never forget that we were called to fulfill his purpose. Paul says in Acts 20, 24, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's the gospel. In other words, you should use your work to glorify God. You should use your family to glorify God. You should use your resources and talents and abilities. Yes, enjoy. Yes, be blessed, but serve God. So here's how we say it. I want to make a difference doing something that makes a difference. And point number three, it has to spread from me to we. Are you following me? It is impossible for one person to make a big difference. It is impossible. Not one person can get things started. But if you want to make a big difference, you need a lot of people doing a lot of things to make a big difference. Ecclesiastes 4.9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. And three is better than two. And 10 is better than three. <laughs> here's, how, here's, here's how we can finalize the, the line. I want to make a difference doing something that makes a difference with people who want to make a difference. That's what it comes down to. And by the way, we read last week in John 15. I don't have it for you, but we read last week. John 15, 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. And then verse 11 says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy, my what? My joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. When? When you are fruitful. And when we're fruitful together. Can I just say something? Here at Vertical Church, we are seeing great victories. We are being fruitful. Pastor, how? Can I just say, can I just say something? Just in 2024, just up to, oh, Cinco de Mayo. Congratulations to all the Mexicans in the house. Just this year, we have had at least 47, 400, 472 people say, I want to follow Jesus as my Savior. <clears throat> Before today, at least 56, then in first service, six got baptized, another one, another seven or eight. Over 65 people have been baptized already this year. 90 life groups were active in spring season. 58 people have completed the growth track and discovered the purpose. We have over 520 people actively serving on our impact team right now. That's awesome. That's awesome. By the way, how else can I serve? How else can I make a difference? We have a missions trip coming up in June uh, to Barranquilla, Colombia. We have a daughter church over there. This is called a Bolsa de Bendición, which means a blessing bag. And we're taking these bags from here. We're not going to fill them up here because $25 here at Publix doesn't go too far. But $25 in Colombian pesos right now, this is going to be so fat. 
and we have to carry them like this. And people, when they receive them, they're like, what's the catch? Why are you giving this to me? What do we have to do? And we're like, no, we just want to love you on behalf of our Vertical Church family in South Florida. We want to tell you God loves you. Can we share a message with you? The gospel and groceries that will probably bless that family for at least a week, maybe more if they're a small family. You can make a difference. 25 bucks on our website, 100% goes right to the families that are in, and people that are in need, 100%. Our goal is 500. Up to today, we have 77, okay? Which means we have less than three weeks, because this has to be before June, because our mission trip is in June, to, we want to fill 500 blessing bags. And maybe you have, a, maybe the Lord puts in your heart to do 10, or to do one for each member of your family. A lot of times my family does that. And we say, hey, we want to bless five families. I don't know about you. You can make a difference even beyond where you live by responding in love. So, in conclusion, you have to choose to be planted and you have to choose to be rooted. Why? If you want to grow spiritually, you will not grow if you are not well planted. If not, talk to any tree or plant that has fallen 10 times. And to be well planted, you got to find a spiritual house where you say, I am part of this family. Now, you cannot grow if you're not well planted and you cannot bear much fruit if you're not deep rooted. So not only do you need to be well planted in a good local church, but you need to be deep rooted by being involved, by being known and needed, by knowing and needing, by loving, by serving, by saying, hey, I'm a work in progress, but I wanna be a part of what God is doing and God has called me to be here. And for many of you today, the call, the push is come out of your comfort zone, whether you're not serving because of because your past cripples you and you think you're not worthy, whether you're not serving because maybe somebody hurt you or you had bad experiences in the past and you're hesitating, just put those excuses to the side. Or whether you're a lone ranger, you think I can do this by myself. You need to know God, can, God never uses just one person. He wants to use his people. It's the body of Christ. And there's something beautiful about when that happens. So I, I wanna, there's even great lessons about certain trees that grow together and that underneath, underneath deep, their roots actually interlock and they're even stronger because of the interwoven roots connecting them. They're, they're like, they're, they're, they, they're, they can't be knocked down. And when you're well planted and well rooted in that way and you're so connected to the Lord and to the right people, man, it brings strength, which brings possibility for growth and flourishing. Maybe you feel stuck. Pastor, I feel stuck. I just don't feel like I'm growing or flourishing. We're here for you. But we can't guess. We can't guess that you need help. Like when's the last time the doctor called you and said, hey, are your lungs hurting right now? Hey, hey, is your knee okay today? Your doctor doesn't call you. You call the doctor and you say, I got some issues. I got some pains, right? And so it's very unlikely that your leader at church or a pastor is going to call you and be like, how's your marriage doing? <laughs> but sometimes you need to be like, I need help. We need help. And we're here. And the Lord is here. And he uses his body, his people. I want to do two prayers. The first one for everybody, for the Lord to help us grow and flourish. Hey, listen, listen, it doesn't have to be here. There's other great churches. This is not the only church. And there's other ways of doing church if you don't align with this vision. We can recommend some for you, even in other cities, other states, or even here. But if you like this one, connect. Be a part of. Don't just be a consumer, be a contributor. Because our team is really good now, but with you on it, it could be even better. I want to do that first prayer. And the second prayer is for anybody who doesn't know Jesus. So let's pray. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for... Your word that teaches us, that encourages us, that lifts us up today specifically. We want to make a difference. We realize, Lord, that in order to make a difference, it's so important to realize the truth that the harvest is plentiful, Lord. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And I pray that in this church, you would multiply the workers. You would multiply the men and women and young people that say, here I am, Lord, use me. I pray, Lord, that in South Florida, we would be more intentional and effective in harvesting more lives of people that do not yet believe in Jesus so that they can know God, so they can eventually find freedom, so they can discover their purpose and then join and be a part of us and together make a difference. Thank you for our church, which is fertile soil, which is a good garden to be planted in. And I pray that many people that are not currently actively serving would be encouraged by you, Holy Spirit, to take the steps of doing the growth track and then saying, here we are, use us. We are a part of this family. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.